Okay, well, hi, everyone. I can't actually see your faces at this stage, but I know that you're in the room. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, and it's lovely to have you with us. So let me start uh, with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge with gratitude that I meet on the traditional lands of the Bunurung people of the Kulin Nation. And I acknowledge and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I invite others of you here tonight, as we, has been our tradition over these six sessions, uh, to share in the chat whose land you are on. So welcome uh, tonight. Uh, I'm Bishop Kate, for those who haven't met me before, and I'm one of the assistant bishops in the Diocese of Melbourne. And on behalf of the Brisbane bishops, uh, Bishop Jeremy and Bishop John, and the Heart Edge team from uh, the UK, I welcome you all to this final and sixth session in our series, Receiving God's Gifts, Recognising Assets and Abundance where we have been exploring, of course, the heart edge model of renewal, catalyzing communities of hope that reimagine church and society with commerce, compassion, culture, and congregation. So before we move into the body of tonight's session, let's pray together. In this shared time, we offer ourselves to each other. We offer our understandings and insights that we ourselves might be challenged and changed. We offer our emotions and experiences that through honesty and openness, we may find and give encouragement and comfort. We offer our skills and talents in joyful recognition and sharing your overflowing bounty. And as we celebrate and offer our common humanity, may you, the incarnate one, be once again embodied here in our individuality and in our community. Amen. Amen. So tonight's session, we will explore the potential for hybrid structures that build community of understanding of how we all flourish in complex working environments. And we'll look at church engagement with business and commercial enterprises and how this relates to business, business ethics and pastoral care. So we're going to um, introduce you to three initiatives that are happening around the mighty Melbourne Diocese. And uh, first up, Richard Wilson will talk to us through the talk us through the experience of business breakfast at two of our urban parishes. And this is a pre-COVID example of engagement with the business community. And then after Richard, Deborah Safri Collins will talk about the development of the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence to become a social justice organisation working to prevent and alleviate poverty. And this is how a religious community has become a social enterprise that nurtures spirituality for people of diverse religious and cultural traditions and including those without any religious affiliation. And then thirdly, Richard again uh, with John Sanderson will share with us the plans for an initiative called the Good Business Project and how the pandemic might be impacting on plans for this initiative. And it will be a reflection on the need to change approaches because of changing business circumstances and practices. You'll be familiar with the Reverend Jonathan Evans, who's a member of the UK Heart Edge team and he'll be chairing tonight's panel discussion. Um, as with previous sessions, uh, they will be recorded, so you'll be able to have access to them after tonight's session. Um, after the presentations have been given, there'll be an opportunity for us all to be uh, have a short time in breakouts where you can spend some time articulating any comments or questions that you may have that you'd like to um, feedback to the panelists tonight. And of course, as you know, they can be put into the chat and then we'll try and address them as much as possible. You may want to uh, address some of your comments uh, and questions to specific panelists. Otherwise, uh, we'll work out who answers uh, what question that you have. Uh, so I'll hand over to Jonathan now. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Bishop Kate, and uh, thanks for your welcome and introduction. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome our panellists 
uh, today, uh, the Reverend Richard Wilson, Reverend Deborah Safri Collins, and the Reverend John Sanderson. Following his experience of business ministry at St. John's Camberwell and St. Peter's Eastern Hill, Richard Wilson has begun work on an initiative called the Good Business Project with a global church-based workplace chaplaincy and some parishes of the Anglican Church in Melbourne to develop a ministry to the Melbourne Docklands and the Yarra business communities. His goal is to establish the Business Project as a hybrid organisation that stands with one foot in the business community and the other in the church and which works to build community understanding of how we all flourish in complex working environments. The tradition of chaplaincy within the Brotherhood of St Lawrence stems from their founder, Anglican priest, Father Gerard Tucker. He believed that ministry should draw on and support people of diverse religious and cultural traditions including those without any religious affiliation. And this belief underpins the Brotherhood's inclusive approach. Led by Deborah Safri Collins, the chaplaincy team provides pastoral care and support for people's spiritual needs and plays a special role in the care of those in uh, aged care facilities and programs. The Reverend John Sanderson was a parishioner at St George's East Ivanhoe until 1997 when he then took up a multi-parish appointment in central Victoria. Subsequently, he served in the army and then as a member of the clergy team of Christ Church St. Lawrence in central Sydney. He's been back as vicar at St. George's East Ivanhoe since 2018 and is a board member of the Mission to Seafarers. So a very warm welcome to all three of you. Um, we're gonna hear firstly from Richard Wilson uh, talking about the Camberwell business ministry and uh, telling us a bit about what it was that they did and why it was that they did it. Over to you Richard, thank you. Thanks Jonathan um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about this this work. I'll give a bit of background first. St John's Camberwell is located uh, to the on the east side of Melbourne CBD about 10 kilometres out. It's on the junction of three major arterial roads that run through uh, Melbourne's east and it's the, the church is actually right or well, one one um, a building block away from the intersection so it's very centrally placed so it's surrounded by um, a large number of retail premises it's a quite a busy shopping area and a probably larger professional services community made up of um, people like financial planners, lawyers, doctors, and uh, just a whole range of um, probably small to medium businesses. The latter, um, that is the professional services people ended up being our target, not, not the retail people. Um, I can go into the reasons for that later if, if you want. The primary objective of this initiative was to build a relationship with the local businesses uh, as a as a component of the local community that is to recognize them as a part of the local community as well as um, um, the people who lived in the area um, and it was a more or less unstructured initiative we didn't really in a sense we didn't really know what we were, we were doing when we started we just uh, took a suck it and see approach uh, and there was no detailed plan for the approach um, and it commenced by, um, after a discussion with a couple of parishioners and the approval of the vicar at the time, um, we agreed that we would have a go at running a, um, a business breakfast. Um, that being the sort of the only, uh, that was the first idea that came to us really, and um, it seemed to be um, um, a reasonable approach. Again, why that was um, the approach I can go into later. So we started off by uh, attempting to build relationship with that community. And the first approaches that I made were through the, the local council. And it was simply to ask them what were the business groups um, already in existence in the area and who were their leaders. And that allowed me to go and, um, so that having identified those leaders, I went and introduced myself to them and started the discussion. 
Um, the surprising thing, I suppose, was how easy that was. Um, the people that I uh, was um, sent off to see were very accepting. Uh, they composed of, were composed of the, um, the local business association and a retail traders uh, organization. <clears throat> and it was the business association, which was probably the best relationship that I had out of the two. The, so the approach, as I said, was to offer a quarterly business breakfast. Uh, it was located or run in the, in the church hall. That wasn't my initial preference, but it turned out that the church had the best and the most central venue available for doing it. <clears throat> the pattern of the, of the program was, as I said, once a quarter, we would run it. Um, and on the day, we um, or sorry, in advance, I was chosen as a person who was able to talk about business in terms of its relationship with the, the broad community. So I, I particularly avoided trying to have an especially church oriented person there. Um, and in fact, almost all of the speakers were not associated with the church in any way. The pattern was that we would invite the people in for a 7.30 start in the morning. We'd have a, a shared uh, continental breakfast which was uh, prepared by the parish catering committee um, at about 10 to 8 the guest speaker was introduced and um, talked for about 20 minutes or thereabouts at about 10 past 8 therefore or 10 um, or 15 minutes past 8 depending on how things were going we opened the floor to questions and at 8 30 we ended, or I ended the formal session um, right on time so the people who had to go to work could leave then. But we, we left the session open and people continued on um, in a question and answer, um, in the question and answer format. Uh, we sort of refilled the coffee pots as it were and, and people stayed around. And often people would um, hang around for another hour or so. So there was a fair bit of networking going on as well as the delivery and, and relationship building, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, when we started, I think the first session, we had about 30 people, um, which we were quite surprised at. And the, the best attended session had 70 people, which was about the capacity uh, of the hall. that we, you know, we couldn't fit any more people in anyway. Um, Uh, I think that it's perhaps later on, I'll, I'll, if people want to, I'll talk about how I actually marketed the um, the idea because that was that was an interesting thing. Um, so that that was the main main focus of, of this initiative. But there was actually two parts to it. The other thing that I did, which you know most of the people in the church weren't particularly aware of, was that I joined the, the Campbellwell Business Club. That was a monthly lunch club. I think it probably was once called the Campbell Businessmen's Club um, and things had only just started changing but that met once a week and through that I developed a very um, quite a large and, and very strong set of relationships with the people who were working particularly in the professional services area. So by the end of my time there you know I, I could walk down the street and always meet one or two people that I knew. So that's what we did. Um, that ran over about three years. I was a curate, so I actually had to leave um, at the end uh, of when my curacy concluded to go on to the next parish, which was actually St. Peter's. And I'll just briefly mention that I did essentially the same thing at St. Peter's. Uh, I won't go into the detail of, of that because it was essentially the same pattern. The, the, some of the dynamics were slightly different, but um, uh, not in, in reality, there wasn't that much difference. Um, I'd like to speak briefly, though, about why we did it and you know, what, what was actually the purpose of, of doing this. And it fell to three major intentions that we had. The first was to build community through this relationship development. Um, and everything that we did was relational. It was about 
getting to meet the people, getting to know to know them, and build the relationships that we could uh, we could use or we could we could um, uh, work through. That was the first thing. The second thing was um, to create a platform for advocacy of the church's worldview. Now we took a very sort of soft approach to that. As I said before, the guest speakers were uh, not um, necessarily um, associated with the church, um, although most of them had a had a, um, a you know, obviously a willingness to attend and, and were sympathetic to what we were trying to do. Um, and we we hoped eventually to to move to a stronger advocacy program so that we could. Um, as I said, expressed uh, opinion about um, business policy um, and that sort of thing. But that was something that would have taken a longer time. We did it a little bit, but it would have taken a longer time to develop, which we, we didn't ever quite get to. The last thing that we were looking at was to build a worshiping community. Um, and that was to identify the people within the business community who were open to joining us for worship and building a worship program that was articulated on the business cycle. And by that, I mean, uh, we could do something, we, what we would do would generally be during or just on the edge of working hours. Um, we might do things like meditation um, and morning and offer morning prayer and maybe meditation as well, that kind of program that, that sort of reflected an interest and a, a pastoral element to um, providing for people in their work in their work life, and also to do some more innovative things such as recognise the um, business cycle. So we might have done something like have a uh, we never got to this, but we might have done something like have a a harvest festival at the end of the financial year or something like that but um but we did get to the point where people had started um very slowly i must say um started coming to us from a, a pastoral care perspective and that was um one of the main um, things that we had to do um that's all i'll say at the moment and then leave it to the questions but i just want make a point one of the things that we learned out of it was that it's a long-term proposition and i think now in retrospect you need to give yourself at least five years if you want to do something like this to get such a program going so that so that it's sustainable so i'll leave it at that john that's great thank you richard that's a really helpful introduction um uh in the research that Richard's done around hybrid organisations, um, he used uh, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence as, um, as an example of a hybrid organisation with one foot in the business world and one foot in the church. So we're gonna hear now from uh, Deborah um, Safri Collins uh, at talking a little about the mission of the Brotherhood and how that relates to the church. Over to you, Deborah, thank you. Thank you, Justin, and hi to everybody. Um, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence uh, is celebrating 90 years this year, and uh, it's quite a landmark for us. I know people normally celebrate a centenary, but it's really interesting to look at the way in which the Brotherhood has been formed over these 90 years and what it actually means for us. Um, so in 1930, in the Diocese of Newcastle in the parish of Adamstown, uh, Jared Kennedy as uh, the priest of Adamstown and a young man who was his student, Guy Coleman Cox, joined by another young man, Michael Clark, uh, were the original uh, brothers of the, of the religious community that became the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. And in 1933, they were invited to come to Melbourne. And it was there that their work really started in earnest. And it's really interesting to look particularly um, at how that, how that work has evolved over time and how I think uh, the Brotherhood has always looked to partners. Um, it's never quite seen, uh, in lots of ways it does its own thing, but always it looks to others to see how it can grow and to actually see the way in which it can be doing work together with others. So um, whilst we might be called a Melbourne um, social justice organisation, we're actually 
Victorian and Australian wide, but just sometimes you wouldn't know it was us because the logo isn't there or the name isn't there. It's a community project with someone else. Um, so Jared Kennedy himself um, came from a clergy family. He was born in Melbourne in, back in 1885. Uh, his father and his grandfather were great advocates of being Christian socialists and lived their lives as clergy in that way and brought that work with them um, from England to Australia and believed fervently that that was the way in which they should be going about their work. So to form the community of the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence uh, in 1930 was actually the end of dream or the beginning of one, I guess, um, for Jerry Kennedy because he'd long dreamt of this opportunity. Uh, it wasn't a religious community that necessarily was setting out in that first instance to, um, to actually be a social justice organisation. It was a religious community where he hoped that he could train young men who would be good priests and have at the back of their mind what it meant to serve the community in which they lived. And that was kind of his original aim. It had very simple rules of living um, and uh, a very... Um, austere way of living. It's often um, joked about that the best thing that Father Tucker loved was his cup of tea and a biscuit uh, and not much else. And he lived on those. Um, but what is what it's become is an organisation of um, 1,500 staff and uh, nearly the same number of volunteers. And we work right across the whole of the, the life cycle in particular areas, but from newborn babies and families uh, through to aged care and in the spaces where, um, sorry, there goes the dogs, of course, um, and in spaces where we are caring for those who are unemployed or for those who are uh, refugees, asylum seekers, people who are experiencing enormous disadvantage. Um, in later years, we've often talked about the fact that poverty diminishes all of us. And, and we understand that as a social justice organisation, it's our role to um, not only address issues of poverty, but seek to advocate on behalf of those uh, who are experiencing disadvantage. And most often we want to do that with the idea that we give uh, a help up rather than a help out. So you don't necessarily find us doing a lot of uh, material aid, although we do do some, but you certainly find us advocating with government and with business and with community and with the everyday person to make a difference in the life of those and to help everybody, therefore, to flourish. My role as uh, head of chaplaincy is twofold. Um, the chaplains of the Brotherhood are in a unique position in, in terms of the fact that um, uh, we are 3.2 3 of us. Uh, in fact, that we actually mostly look after the carers, so those caring for others. So our role is particularly focused on the staff of the Brotherhood and the volunteers who service and care for those um, around them. But also I have a role um, of, of being the connector to the Diocese of Melbourne and the way in which we continue to see ourselves in partnership with the Diocese. So Jerry Kennedy, in his own way, often uh, kept, kept the church a bit at arm's length. Um, and there's lots of funny stories about that. But nonetheless, he could see how important it was um, that there was there was a partnership here too. And whilst we are uh, incorporated through an act of parliament, we do understand that the diocesan, the diocesan partnership, uh, the way in which together we see and help people flourish is just as important as the other work that we do. So over its um, post the Second World War, the community itself pretty much died off. The men who had been part of the Brotherhood um, had gone off to the Second World War. Um, Tucker himself had been in the First World War as a chaplain. He buried nearly a thousand men um, around the Somme and uh, he remembered and named and wrote to every one of their families this extraordinary compassion that he shared with others throughout his life journey. And so there were those uh, who went to the Second World War and at the end of the time, uh, he was pretty much the only, um, the only person who was left uh, as part of that community. Um, we then introduced other great names of the church into the life of the Brotherhood who came with great administration and pastoral skills and with a great sense of social justice. And we start to see a lot of the partnership work. So 
um, in the 1940s when Tucker was still very much at the, at the realm, at the head of the Brotherhood, um, uh, movies presented about poverty in Melbourne uh, called the films the Premier wouldn't see because he wouldn't. But then the very next day after Tucker had shown them in Fitzroy, he was very keen to see what it was that the Brotherhood was on about. Um, we then step into arenas such as uh, floods in India, which were the beginning of a community aid abroad, which is now Oxfam Australia, started by Jared Tucker. So this constant idea that we are involving ourselves in the life of community and practice, and that we step forward into, um, into other realms and other partnerships. Uh, today, we do that through um, working in partnership with the ANZ Bank around helping people to budget and save. We do that through programs like Stepping Stones for Women who help young, young and older women who are often um, refugees or asylum seekers to start up their own small businesses. You see us involved in the Good Start um, early learning centres around Australia, in the Hippie program, which is teaching young children uh, often on Indigenous communities around Australia um, and parents as their first children in kindergarten and so on. So this constant sense in which um, not only are we advocating and doing our own work backed by lots of research, we have lots of researchers involved in the Brotherhood's life, but that we're seeing that we make connections all the time. And we do work very hard to be uh, friends across the whole of the three levels of government in Australia and uh, both sides of it so that we can actually open the conversation to how change can happen in, in our society and in community. I guess on a more uh, local nature in terms of working alongside parishes, um, we developed a program in, relation, in connection with the Diocese of Melbourne through their parish partnership, Archdeacons. And that program is called the Good Neighbour Project, where we help parishes to discern uh, how they can make a contribution in their own community. Brotherhood doesn't work in every suburb of Melbourne, but we can certainly support parishes who are trying to work out how they can be good neighbours in their own community. So I hope that's giving you just a little bit of example of how we do go about the work that we do and we start to do it uh, together as partners. And, uh, you know, there's lots of, um, I could reel off a whole lot of different organisations that you'd be aware of that the Brotherhood has had a, has a, had a helping hand in starting. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, uh, we're going to go to our third example, um, which is uh, really a little bit about what Richard did next. Um, but uh, we're going to hear about the Good Business Partnership and its connections with the Mission to Seafarers. And maybe John Sanderson can start us off here. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, good morning to friends in London. Good evening to friends and uh, visitors across Australia who joined us this evening for this uh, final session of Heart Edge. The Mission to Seafarers has its origins in the Bristol Channel in England in the early, early 1800s when John Ashley, whilst on holiday, uh, encountered the harsh living conditions of the then seafarers and dedicated the next 15 years of his life to responding to their care. Here in Victoria, the Mission to Seafarers uh, was founded in 1857 and moved to its current location in the um, Docklands area of Melbourne around about 1917. The Mission to Seafarers essentially is there to care for the spiritual and welfare needs of all seafarers, regardless of religious tradition or none, and has done so, as I said, in this city for over 100 years. Its um, modus operandi has been historically to uh, visit seafarers in their place of employment aboard their ships whilst uh, alongside in the port of Melbourne. And this has been going on, as I said, for over 100 years. COVID uh, presented a significant challenge and that's in this country, uh, seafarers have not been allowed to disembark from their ships since the first lockdown just over a year ago. And as we know, many of them have now been spending more than their regulated 10 months uh, uh, afloat on a ship due to the inability to disembark and return to their homelands. 
we've remained open and have continued to serve and care for uh, seafarers unconditionally throughout this past year. And as we sought to uh, meet their needs, uh, particularly their material needs and their social needs through uh, interaction via social media channels. Over a year ago though, we sought to reimagine um, how we might engage not only with seafarers, but also with the people of Melbourne. And so through the Ministry of Richard and his project, the Good Business Project, we sought to partner with Richard and his desire to connect with the business community in the city of Melbourne. Those of us, those of you who know Melbourne will know that over the last 10 to 15 years, the center of gravity for the business community has moved from the top end of Collins Street and the vicinity of Parliament down into the Docklands area. So we thought there was an opportunity there to partner with Richard and see how we might engage with the local community and how they might engage with us and they might come to capture uh, the passion of those who already serve at the mission seeking to care unconditionally for seafarers and to advocate for their needs both at the local and international level. And so by partnering with Richard we hope to engage with a different demographic within the Docklands community, which has two communities, those who work there and those who now call the Docklands their residential home. Uh, COVID has provided a significant challenge and that the Docklands bus business community has drastically reduced as people work from home and uh, only small numbers are now beginning uh, to return to uh, that part of the CBD or the Docklands area of uh, Melbourne. But we will continue to explore with Richard ways in which we might uh, engage with the business community and will engage with others in how we might engage with the residential community so that they might uh, seek to exercise a ministry of compassion to seafarers in partnership with ourselves. And who knows, we might even through our small chapel and other spaces create a new worshipping community, uh, God willing, uh, on the site of the mission. I'll pause there now and hand back to Jonathan as we hopefully seek to engage with your questions and observations through the course of this evening. Yeah, thank you very much, John. So we're going to uh, explore a few broader questions before handing back to uh, Bishop Kate, who will take us through the uh, sort of open discussion um, section of this session. Um, so I wonder, first of all, um, I mean, Richard, um, in your presentation, you were talking about having a kind of suck it and see um, approach to uh, the business ministry in um, Camberwell um, when you first started out. I, I wonder to what extent there's a need for specialist um, skills or experience um, or not, as the case may be, in terms of um, engaging uh, with the business community and uh, Deborah in terms of setting up and running social enterprises. Um, so who would like to kick us off with a response to that question? I'll go. Thanks, um, so the question is, um, is there a need for specialist skills? I don't think so. Um, the, the, the primary skill is the ability to, to develop relationships with people, which, um, you know, you sort of, everyone has to some, a greater or lesser extent. I think um, that question though comes to something else that might actually be a barrier. I suspect that a lot of people, particularly clergy who've been um, long time clergy, uh, may find the business community daunting from the perspective of perhaps not knowing um, what business is about, not knowing how to have a conversation with the business community. Um, and, and I had the advantage, I guess, of um, about uh, 20 years working in, in business and uh, um, over 10 years prior to that working in government. So I, I didn't really feel any particular hesitation to walking out. But but I think the, the point I should make though is the business people don't expect someone from the church to be a business person, quite the opposite. Um, so you don't really need to worry about whether you understand accounting or financial planning or any of those sorts of things. I think the um, one day um, I was sitting at the lunch table in the at the Campbell Business Club. So this wasn't our initiative, it was the other one. Um, and one of the people just leaned over and said, um, 
you know, it's really great to have someone from the church. So they'd had the local Baptist minister previously, and they, they just appreciated having someone from the church around. So I don't, that, that's a sort of a, an attempt to sort of say, don't, don't hesitate because you think you don't understand what it's going to be like. Just go and create relationships. Um, you know, as someone famous said, I can't remember who it was, just, just connect and the rest will flow. Thank you, Richard. Um, Deborah, how, how does that question play out in the field of social enterprise? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, historically, um, we saw people who came together as volunteers um, who showed great compassion uh, for wanting to make a difference in the world. And um, the experience they brought with them was the love of God, basically, um, and, and their desire to make a difference. Um, today, of course, we're an organisation like many uh, organisations of the same that has many professional people attached to it. But in terms of social enterprise, our most successful one, or one of our most successful ones, would have to be our online bookshop, um, which started with a couple of boxes of books and an idea to put books online and sell them. Um, you can't believe how many books we sold during COVID while everybody was emptying out their bookshelves, people were buying more. Um, but it, it, it was about having a business sense and a desire to be able to get in and give it a go. And no one really knew whether that online bookstore would do well or not. Um, it's, it's great, it's fantastic. Um, we have 23, 24 opportunity shops. The first was started in the 1950s. Again, that focus on how does community come together and how does it serve one another? Um, and those stores have played various roles over the years from providing clothing for those who weren't able to afford anything to being a financial resource to the organisation. Um, alongside projects and programs that require people with um, great professional knowledge to come and run them and operate them. Um, but often I have the great joy of sitting alongside volunteers who come from extraordinarily um, broad parts of our community with extraordinarily different uh, experiences of life and contribute into all sorts of different programs of the Brotherhood's work um, simply by this no notion of wanting to do something to make a difference. And, uh, and for many of them who come from um, faith communities and, you know, we said at the beginning, we're now an organisation that, and in fact, Tucker always did this. He always welcomed, his, he pretty much said, if you're not against us, you're with us and how are we going to change the world together? And, uh, and there's a real sense of that in the Brotherhood in the way in which we work together. Thank you so much. So I'm wondering next how these initiatives um, sit with our models of church and whether they, um, they actually change those. Um, I'm wondering whether some of these would sort of fit under the heading of fresh expressions and, and also what it means um, to be a hybrid organisation with one foot in the business community and one foot in the church. Um, I wonder, John, whether you'd like to kick us off on that one. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I think um, it may well be perceived as a fresh expression when if it's a brand new initiative of a local church or a mission organisation, such as the Brotherhood or... Um, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence on the Mission to Seafarers. So in essence, they can be fresh expressions or they're literally partnerships of like-minded people who seek to uh, embrace the heart edge model of finding God at the edges of society and edges of life and edges of community uh, to connect people in a, in a relational way as Richard and Deborah have so ably discussed earlier. And so I think as long as you're comfortable with having your mind in different places, uh, it can be a, a real opportunity to flourish and to set people free and to use their imaginations uh, as opposed to being stuck in the local uh, a mindset of a local church, which is for some people is limited to worship on a Sunday and feast days, uh, whereas a hybrid model might set you free uh, to really flourish and to draw upon the skills, gifts, the talents of all the people in your community or your mission organization and be very rich uh, as the imagination is brought to bear. Thank you, John. 
Richard, this is your area of research, so um, fill us in on this in a little bit more detail. Sorry, uh, Jonathan, was that to me? Yes, yes please, yeah. Didn't hear it, so. Okay, um, I would um, expand on what John said and say so my, my experience of church has been or the, as a model as you come to us and you participate in what we do um, using the forms um, of, of uh, participation that we have set down. I think this sort of hybrid model takes a, a completely opposite approach in the sense of you, I mean, my attitude was to go out to meet the business people where they were, notwithstanding that they actually came into the parish hall um, for, for the breakfast. But the engagement was not on the basis of being at church. The engagement was on the basis of being in a community, a network community of business people talking to them in terms that they understood and doing things that they understood. It, was, it wasn't um, intended to try and build the numbers of the church. And in fact, um, for one of the breakfasts, our then regional bishop visited and, and came to the breakfast. And at the end of it, she came up to me and said, oh, Richard, how many people um, come on Sunday from this community? And I said, exactly zero, Bishop, which is what I expected. And she looked a bit surprised, but um, but that's what I expected. So you, you, the model is to take the church out of the church building. You know, so cease being a building, cease uh, become the body of Christ, um, which is peripatetic. And uh, um, you know, that's the, the fundamental difference. And the, the hybridity of it is that you have to start thinking uh, in the sort of the thinking space of the business community, not the thinking space of the church, or not completely. You've got a mix. Thank you. And Deborah, your take on this, uh, from what we've heard of the Brotherhood, it's very much an organisation that's um, with uh, the community. I think that's that We're not sure that we would identify necessarily um, if you if you if we talk to each other, would we definitely um, see ourselves as um, uh, a hybrid? Maybe we are. Maybe we are. Um, would we see ourselves as fresh expressions? I could talk that language. I'm not sure that my colleagues would talk that language. Um, I, I think the idea and the understanding that we are um, our founding stories as a faith-based organisation is very important um, to all of the people that work with us in lots of different ways. Um, they understand that here, here are people of faith, um, at least in the founding story, who, who came to make a difference and to say that uh, Christ calls us to this work and we are here to do it. Um, and the respect um, that is given comes in lots of different ways um, for, my brothers and sisters of different um, different faiths that work in the brotherhood or come to the brotherhood looking for help um, is an understanding that uh, in different ways organizations are are about at least for us telling the gospel story um, but the idea that we are there um, being the good neighbor supporting each other caring uh, working for community sits well with people. Thank you all so much. That's really helpful. Um, uh, at this point in proceedings, it's time for us to hand back to Bishop Kate and um, initiate some uh, wider conversation and discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks so much to uh, John and Richard and Deb, three different presentations uh, with, with things in common, of course, and I think it uh, been very, uh, really hopefully stimulating us um, with questions and comments and thoughts about 
um, about mission, about who we are as an organisation, about what our, our belief system is and how we live that out in the community um, beyond the four walls of our church. So we're going to go into the breakouts now for about five minutes just to stimulate some questions and comments and then we'd really appreciate you putting those into the chat so that we can use them when we come back to the plenary and have our Q&A discussion um, with the members of the panel and Jonathan.